Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are on to viruses. So we can do chapter 13. Today, we're going to be working on um, going over viruses and a little bit on viroids and prions in our very last video. So um, viruses, interesting little critters. They are um, not really alive. I know we are right smack dab in the middle of a global pandemic with an interesting virus called the coronavirus. I will try to incorporate some current events into some of the conversations that we have here. Um, but yeah, viruses are acellular, uh, intracellular parasites, and they affect all living things. Um, I personally do not consider them living. There's some, still some argument about whether they are considered living or not. My justification for that classification is one, they um, are acellular. And I attribute, um, or I believe um, in the characteristics of living things where all living things are made of cells and cells are the smallest unit of life. And if you are not composed of a cell, you are not considered a living thing. So that's kind of like my mantra of biology. Um, viruses also cannot metabolize um, on their own. They can't metabolize at all. They utilize the cell. They are um, intracellular parasites. They basically hijack their host cell. They replicate with the host cell's machinery and enzymes and ATP. Um, they do not respond to the environment. They cannot maintain homeostasis. You know, it's more than just a cell thing that keeps, keeps them off of my list of living things. So in this first, uh, first section, we're just going to introduce viruses, going to talk about some of their characteristics, and we have a whole bunch of other slew of fun topics we're going to cover with viruses, viruses and prions. Um, so first of all, what is a virus? So before we can talk about some of their characteristics, basically, what are they? Well, um, in essence, they are basically two ingredients. They are protein. I'm just going to draw a very basic geometric shape here. So they are protein coat, some kind of container um, that then inside has some kind of nucleic acid. Um, and what's interesting about vir viruses is they could either be a DNA virus or an RNA virus. We have yet to find any that are both DNA and RNA. Um, and then there's various styles, if you want to call it, various types of DNA or RNA combinations that they can be. So we're going to get to that when we get to um, different genomes and things like that, and also viral replication. So that's really it. There are two parts. They have a protein coat, and they have a nucleic acid. And that really is um, all that they have. There's some bells and whistles on some other nucle um, on some other viruses. They might have an envelope, or they could have some spiky things, or might have an extra matrix case around their nucleic acid. They might have some extra enzymes kind of crammed in that protein coat, but really that's the essence of what a virus is. It's a protein coat and a nucleic acid core. Um, they don't have cell membranes. Some of them have an envelope, like I mentioned before. They're not capable of metabolic activity on their own. Um, and they can be classified by lots of different ways, which is going to bring us into these viral characteristics. So let's let's kind of jump in. So um, there are uh, various types of viruses. So I've shown a couple here. Um, this picture on the left, this is showing those two basic ingredients. We have the protein coat, which is what we call a capsid. And then we have the nucleic acid, which is our viral genome. And this is what could be either the DNA or the RNA. So this is a very basic picture um, of a virus. And so now here are some examples of viruses with some of those bells and whistles. So again, here is our protein coat. Here's our nucleic acid. That's the the foundation of what a virus is. This is a picture of a bacteriophage, which some of the bells and whistles gives them a tail sheath, some tail fibers, and some end plates, which allow them to attach to their particular um, host. Here's another virus again. Here is our capsid, which is kind of the golden thing. Here's our nucleic acid, but they have some bells and whistles with a couple enzymes. They have an uh, envelope and some glycoprotein spikes, but we're following the same pattern capsid proteins around a nucleic acid um, genome. Okay. So what can their genome be made up of? And so this I have listed here in the um, notes. You could have a virus that has double-stranded DNA. Okay, that's what the DS stands for. You can, that's like us. We have double-stranded DNA for comparison's sake. So if you want to say, well, what's double-stranded DNA? That's what we have. That's what you learned mainly about in Bi211. Um, you can have single-stranded DNA. 
So you get a virus that just has half of a DNA molecule, and that's their normal genome. You could have a virus um, that is single-stranded RNA, right? And so RNA viruses, that's their only genome is made up of RNA. They don't even have any DNA whatsoever. And this could be either what we call positive or negative strands, sense and nonsense. We're going to see that in the animal virus replication video. Um, because so there's a couple different types of the single-stranded RNA. We could also have double-stranded RNA, something that we don't ever see in our cells, to double, like a double-stranded DNA but with RNA bases, weird. Um, and then we can have a, um, a form of a double-stranded DNA, which is called a retrovirus. I'll just abbreviate there since I'm running out of room. So we have quite a variety of genomes that viruses can have, and that's part of their classification. Do they fall into the group of double-stranded DNAs, single-stranded DNAs, single-stranded RNAs? Are you positive or negative, a double-stranded RNA or a retrovirus? The coronavirus that's causing all of our wonderful issues that are happening in the world right now, they are um, single-stranded RNA positive. So it's called a sense strand or an RNA positive single-stranded virus of the coronavirus classification. Okay. Um, the, the actual chromosome, I guess, you don't really want to call it a chromosome, but the piece of nucleic acid could either be linear or it could be circular. It could be single pieces or it could be multiple pieces. So whereas bacteria have one single chromosome, of double-stranded DNA, maybe with some plasmids, circular plasmids, and humans have 46 linear individual pieces of DNA, viruses can have a combination of different types of um, genome shapes and sizes, I guess. Um, and they're a lot smaller. So again, here, um, kind of really so showing some pictures. I think this is one nanometer for scale. You have this picture in your book. Um, the scale bars kind of like are right here. So bacteria are about two nanometers, and you can see this was similar to our picture when we were looking at plasmids. And viral genomes are about the same size as a plasmid. So here would be, the blue kind of blends in. So there would be one of those um, bacteriophages or plasmid, I guess it could be either one. And then now on this picture, we're at the scale of 200 nanometers, which would be 0.2 microns. Um, this would be a, a viral genome just some of its nucleic acid on the electron micrograph. All right, another way we can classify or give characteristics to viruses is their host. So all living things are viral hosts. So plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, protists, algae, you know, you name it. If it's a living thing made up of cells, there are viruses that can attack it. Um, so here I have humans, here I have insects, cows, plants, uh, bacteria with the bacteriophages sticking off. So you're going to have viruses basically uh, attack any living thing. Now they're specific, usually. There's some generalists out there. But this particular, the plant virus is called a tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and it was the first virus to be discovered. And you can kind of see here's the healthy leaf on the right hand side and kind of the model -y mosaic on the left hand side. That's where it gets its name. But this tobacco mosaic virus doesn't affect just tobacco plants. They can find it in like tomatoes and peppers, kind of of a similar family of plants, where some viruses like rabies only infects mammals. It doesn't affect any other type of animal, only mammals. We talked a little bit about bacteriophages and bacteriophage therapy. They are very specific to their strains of bacteria that they would be able to infect. Okay, so we can classify um, viruses by their host. All right, we can take a look at their size. How do they compare to eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells? So this one, if you did the how big is a um, interactive thing back in chapter three or that um, scale of the universe website that I showed you back in chapter four. So this is kind of the same idea. We're just zooming way in, zooming way in. So our red blood cells are some of the smallest cells in the human body. Compare that to an E. coli, which is way smaller than that. And now we've zoomed in on the E. coli and we can see a small pox virus, which is pretty big. Now we see that here compared to some of these other um, structures. Here's that tobacco mosaic. Here's a bacteriophage. Here's polio. Here's another bacteriophage. And here's bacterial ribosomes just for comparison. So some viruses are as small as ribosomes, which are these intracellular organelles. And um, yeah, so viruses are really, really small. Before they were actually called viruses, um, kind of a little bit of a history here, they were called filtrable infectious agents. 
The reason why they're called filtrable is because if you remember in chapter six, we had that membrane filter, right? So you had this filter that had really small pores on it, and then you kind of put it through your flask, and then you collected, you know, your little liquid on the bottom, uh, or you collected the bacteria here. But viruses were so small that they were filtered through these really small filters that collected all bacteria, and then they injected this into a host, and the host got sick. They're like, something came through the filter, it ended up in what we collected, we put that into a, a susceptible host and the host got sick. So filterable infectious agents. They didn't know what, what they were, probably until electron microscopy came around. So now we just call them viruses or vi um, virions. Okay, so we can classify them by their size. We can classify them by their shape. So there's three major shapes of viruses. We have helical, polyhedral, and complex. So this is an example, let me see a good color, maybe blue back. Um, this is helical. Here's some more helical, right? They just kind of look like long, they're like a spiral, like a helix. Polyhedral are kind of like um, geometric shapes. And then uh, complex. So bacteria fissures are complex. This is smallpox right here. It has what we call a characteristic dumbbell shape. So that's neither long and helical, nor is it polyhedral. So it kind of goes into this um, miscellaneous category of complex. This is rabies right here. And so we call a characteristic bullet shape like this. It's rounded on one end, kind of flat on the other with all these little spikes that stick off. So these are what we call complex shapes. And then here's just some more viral shapes. We have three pictures of HIV, which is a polyhedral um, virus, and then Ebola, which is, I don't know if it's helical, it's called filamentous. Um, so it's either helical or complex, I'm not quite sure, but it always kind of has this typical little curly Q doodad at one end. Um, if you want a kind of a crazy over dramatic movie about Ebola, you can watch Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman and Morgan Freeman and Cuba Gooding Jr. It's pretty good, but way over the top. <laughs> um, okay, so we can also classify bacteria based on their presence or absence of a viral envelope. So I have two pictures of viral envelopes, one of a with a helical capsid. So here's that helix shape, right? So kind of long and tube-like. So just the capsid proteins are kind of wrapping around and the DNA would be inside of this, right? So the DNA or RNA would be inside of this. And then it's wrapped by this envelope. Now, where does the envelope come from? They're not cells, so they're not making their own phospholipid bilayers. These envelopes come from, as the virus is budding off, or out of the cell, it acquires that phospholipid bilayer from its host cell. So viruses that have envelopes, those envelopes used to belong to whatever cell it was infecting. So they could bud out of the nuclear envelope and get a viral envelope from that structure. Um, any of the endomembranous organelles like the Golgi or the endoplasmic reticulum, they can acquire their envelopes. And obviously from the plasma membrane itself, as they bud off, um, they can acquire their envelope that way. Now, not all viruses are envelopes, just the enveloped viruses have envelopes. So just keep that in mind. Some of them don't even have an envelope. They would just be their capsid, would be their outermost structure. And then here's just another representation of viral envelope with a polyhedral capsid, right? So that polyhedral shape with all those, usually it's a 20-sided icosahedron is a, a common shape for viral um, uh, capsids. And so then here's again showing the membrane with all of these some of these envelope proteins, which are the, the recognition proteins, the spikes. In the coronavirus, this is why coronavirus gets its name is because it has all of these spikes sticking out of its envelope. Um, and under the microscope, it looks like a crown. So corona means crown. That's where that name comes from. All right. So there's lots of different characteristics about viruses. They're a varied group of infectious pathogens, intracellular parasites. Um, so there's lots of variety in their characteristics. All right. So that wraps up this uh, little mini lesson. I will see you next time.